did bring some handouts and posters that we're hoping you all take with you at the end of this event today. Creative Mornings, if you don't know, there's 268 chapters worldwide. And in the state of Virginia, there are only two chapters, one in Richmond and one now in Virginia Beach. So we're very proud of that. And what a great way to document and really share with the world the creatives that live here in Virginia Beach. So I hope that you will talk to people about this and share and invite people to come back month after month. Um, tonight, or today, we're so excited to have Rowena with us. I wanted to read one sentence out of her bio that really stuck out to me. Let's see here. Um, and he, I'm sure you all read her full bio, but the sentence that stuck out to me was, a passionate and outspoken activist for the rights and needs of underrepresented communities, Rowena serves on the Virginia Asian Advisory Board, the Virginia Art Education Association's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and Access Committee, and the Virginia Beach Public Schools Equity Council. So we're very pleased to have her here, not only as a talented artist, um, but as an activist and a real community leader. So without further ado, we want to welcome up our guest speaker, Miss Rowena. really excited about being here this morning and getting to share my work. Uh, tell you a little bit more about me. I was born and raised in this area. My dad, my parents are Filipino and my dad came over uh, because he joined the Navy when he was 18. And um, you know, unlike a lot of other families, even though he served in the military for over 20 years, um, he only had to move once from California to Virginia, uh, the Hampton Roads area. And then unlike a lot of families, we didn't have to move again. <laughs> So, um, you know, it's, it's really interesting being here and uh, swearing as a teenager that when I left for college, I would never come back. Um, and looky here, here I am in Virginia Beach with a mortgage and three kids in public schools, going to the exact same schools I went to <laughs> when I was a kid. Um, and, and that was, uh, it, it's been an interesting journey um, because like I'm in my 40s now and um, I went to school at JMU and I fell in love with living in the country. Um, I loved living in the Shenandoah Valley. And it's, you know, we stayed up there, after I got married, we still stayed up there for like another, another year. Mike kind of goes in and out. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, but over time, like, the vast majority of people that I met and worked with and hung out with in the valley were really awesome, very friendly. But then there were definitely instances of people letting me know that I am not from there and I don't look like I'm from there and I don't belong there. <laughs> and that, that was the first time like being at JMU, when you're on campus, it's a very mixed um, populace. So it still felt pretty normal, like growing up here because in, um, you know, I, I live in the Kempsville area and it's still a very, very diverse area. I mean, it's still predominantly white, but there are like huge pockets. It's got a huge Filipino uh, population there, lots of other Asians, uh, big black community. Um, and so as a kid growing up, I just, I just felt like me. You know, like, yeah, I have a Filipino family and there are things that we have that other families don't have and vice versa. But it just, you know, I grew up very fortunate to just feel like an American, just feel like I was from this area. And then going to JMU, everything felt normal. But then as you start to explore off campus, you realize what it's like. And that was the first time in my life that I, I was like, oh, I, I really feel like I'm not white. You know, and, and that was kind of jarring and, and, and you know, um, really annoying. Um, <laughs> my husband, um, he's white, and um, he, he played for like two or three years um, with this country band. And I mean, I did not grow up listening to country, but if anybody's familiar with like 90s country music, it was like awesome, right? And, and he was like in this really, really good band. And, and so I would go um, to a lot of the events, like my friends and I would go. And in particular, there was like one of those, um, it was a moose club. And I would go 
to support the band. And the people in his band were great. Like, I loved them, they loved me. They were totally wonderful, decent human beings. But every time I would go to this moose club, the same guy at the door would stop me and would not let me come in until someone from the band claimed me. And I would, I would keep going. Cause I was just like, I have every right to be here. You know, like I'm supporting the band. I'm literally the only Asian girl in like a hundred mile radius who's going to try to come into your club just to see the band. I swear it's the same me, you know? I'm just gonna sit with the band. And, and so things like that, you know, they, they will affect you even if you say you don't let them affect you. Um, because, you know, I am an American. I was born and raised here. When I was growing up, um, you know, especially as a Filipino, Filipinos are kind of weird in that of all the Asian groups, we're the ones who are the most comfortable blending into American life because of how uh, Americans work in the Philippines for so long. So learning English, being familiar with the culture, it's just in our DNA. <laughs> Go America! <laughs> I hate jet noise. <laughs> um, so, you know, like these things affect you even if you don't realize. And I remember, you know, like, so growing up, you just kind of let these things roll off your back, or at least I did. Like, I didn't really think about them, um, which is why it's been so interesting bringing this concept of identity into my artwork because for the longest time, I I just kind of disavowed my Filipino heritage because like there are a lot of parts of it that, that really frustrate me. And, um, and I was also raised because like Filipino Americans, again, it's, it's an interesting um, dynamic because we are taught from a very young age to just assimilate, which was not even a term that I was familiar with. I really only learned it a few years ago when I started reading, um, uh, guy that wrote the book about anti-racism. I can't remember his name at the moment. But anyway, it's a wonderful book and he talks about assimilation. And, it, and I thought, oh my God, like that's, that's what I've been doing. And, um, and you know, it's, I question like every day who I am and who I wanna be going forward and what my experiences were like. Um, as a kid, and one of the things that really sticks out to me a lot, which is why I'm really excited to get to talk about this term native and what that means, is um, that to a lot of people, um, when your nose is rounded like mine and when your skin is darker like mine, and it's not even like that dark, like for a Filipino, I'm pretty light skinned, um, you get a lot of people who ask like where you're from, and then me, being from Virginia Beach, I'm like, oh, I'm from Virginia Beach. You know, and then you can see like this confusion in people's eyes. I remember um, my family, we took um, that ferry ride to Tangier Island uh, when I was uh, probably about 20 years old. And it was a blast and we had a great time. Of course you go to eat the crab cakes, you know, and everybody's sitting picnic table style. And there's this, this sweet older woman next to me. And I'm just this kid and she's like, where are you from? And you know, I go, Virginia Beach. And she looks so confused. And I kind of looked at her like, why are you confused, you know? And, and I know that she was expecting a more exotic answer and was probably thinking um, that I didn't have an accent or that I speak really well, you know? And it's funny because like, this is all I speak. I don't speak Tagalog. I don't even really understand it, you know? Because when I was a kid, listening to my, my parents and my, um, my relatives speaking in Tagalog, I had always assumed that to listen in would be really rude. Like nobody ever said that to me, but I was like, oh, they're having a conversation, I shouldn't listen, you know? And so it just, it never like, aside from a handful of words, it just never became part of my life. Um, and so like there, there are so many things now, like as I, as I'm raising my children, you know, like they're half Filipino and half white, and there's this growing movement of um, making space for, for people who are of mixed heritage and mixed race, um, 
because, you know, it dawned on me that they're going to have experiences. My children are going to have experiences as mixed race children that I will never understand, that I will never experience for myself because that's not part of my world, that's going to be a part of theirs. And so like this, this is the kind of thing that drives the activism. Like I actually um, had to step down from a lot of the uh, organizations that I had been very active in um, because over the past year, um, my oldest came out, and yes, I'm doing this with my oldest permission. Um, my oldest came out as transgender. So like as somebody who has been a teacher at the Governor's School of the Arts, uh, for the arts, um, for the past six, seven years, um, I've seen so many kids there who only feel safe at our school because we honor who they are. And I have seen kids get pulled from that school because the parents were angry that we wouldn't honor what they wanted. And so, um, you know, it's just, it's very frustrating to see people who are parenting from this point of wanting to control their child's lives. And it's really um, a passion of mine to support children to be exactly who they're supposed to be. Because as Filipino American female, I have felt denied that. Now I am straight and I've never felt anything other than cis, you know, gender, whatever. But as a Filipina, growing up here. Um, I was totally allowed to do art in high school. Like, oh, you're so talented, this is great. The moment I breathed the idea that I would like to study art in the real world, my parents said, no. We're the ones who are paying for your college. You need to pick something else. And so, um, what's really funny is that I, I settled on archeology. span and I'm like, they're okay with it. I guess it sounds more prestigious. I don't know, because I'm like, it's, it's about as lucrative as being an artist, I guarantee. Uh, but, um, you know, eventually I was able to wheedle my way into art by saying, oh, let me go into graphic design. I can get a job in graphic design. I hated graphic design. Um, I eventually did get a degree in fine art because I think at that point my parents were just like, please just graduate, just pick something and graduate, you know, so I did. I was able to graduate and, um, but still, you know, the seed had been planted that, um, that I'm not allowed to do art or, or that nobody is allowed to do art. I literally grew up thinking that the Philippines must not have artists. Like, I never thought about it, but it was just this unconscious idea because I had never seen anything. Like, even though I had been to the Philippines as a kid, you know, when you go to the Philippines as, you know, as your first trip, the only thing you get to do is visit as much family as possible and eat a lot of food. Like, that's literally it. Like, you don't go to see anything, you just spend time with your family. So, um, I just came back from my third trip last year, and I basically begged my parents, please let us make time to go see a few art museums, you know? And at the time I was writing for Portrait, uh, Portrait Society of America, so I made it like a job, even though it was a volunteer thing. I'm like, I'm gonna write this article, so you have to let me go see the art, you know? And, and we were able to, to make time for it. Um, but, you know, I, I really had no idea, and, and now I'm still in this very early process within like a year or two of discovering how many Filipino and Filipino-American artists, like visual artists, there actually are. Um, and I mean, like, none of them are household names here for sure, and, and I don't even know in the Philippines, like, how many people are really, really aware of them. Um, but it has become more important to me as I circle back, because, like, digging into the artwork that I've been doing has, has dug up a lot of um, memories and um, just, ideas about like why it's important for me you know like I, I didn't originally ever want to do art that had to do with my identity like I didn't want to do art that had to do with my being a mother because like there's this whole niche about like artists who are making art about motherhood and it's like I love my kids I love being mother but but for me it felt reductive to um, to make art simply about being a mother um, because it felt like 
that's already an identity that I can't get away from anyway. You know, <laughs> like what about the me that existed before I became a mother? Um, I see a lot of women nodding. You know exactly what I mean. Um, and so I've, I've literally said to my children, like, I love, I love having you in my life, and you guys have given me so much. But I was like, you know, being a mother isn't everything. It's not enough. It's not enough for me. But to be able to say that out loud is kind of a radical thing, you know, because it's like some people will be like, oh, well, why isn't it enough? It's like, because I'm a whole person. And, and, you know, that goes back to this whole thing about being Filipino, because like as a female Filipino, there, I was raised just, even if nobody ever actually said it, there was just this understanding that we were supposed to be obedient and meek and silent, which are three things I have never been. And then as I look at the history of Filipino women, they're pretty badass, like they have fought. There was this whole thing about this one woman who was teaching other soldiers how to slice people's heads off during um, the fight against the Americans. You know, I was, that was not that long ago. And, and so I'm thinking, you know, where did we lose? <laughs> like, where did we start getting this idea that, that we're supposed to be meek and quiet, you know? And, and then there is this other idea too, that like, even if you go away to college, you're supposed to come back and move right back into your family's house. And, and I didn't do that because when I graduated, I had a job up in Harrisonburg. And I said, um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna stay here. And I remember my mother saying, who's gonna take care of you? And I thought, oh my God, I'm like 20, 21, you know, however old you are when you graduate college. And I thought, aren't I supposed to be taking care of myself? I mean, I kind of am, you know? And, and um, that's just one of the things that really stuck with me because I have clashed heads. I, I've, I've clashed with so many people in the Filipino community um, because I, keep trying to point out that there are so many people like me who avoid the Filipino American community here because we don't feel like we belong, because we don't fit that mold. Because, you know, we are this weird mix of being very tied to our Filipino culture, but also very tied to the American culture in ways that the establishment isn't comfortable with and they don't know what to do with us, you know? And I keep saying, well, you need to make space for us because eventually we're going to be all that's left, <laughs> you know? Um, and so there's that, there's that whole idea of like, in my work, addressing identity through my own lens, because obviously, how else am I going to do it? You know, like, I think sometimes people um, get uncomfortable around me because I, I can be very blunt and, and just say things that make people feel uncomfortable, but I kind of feel like, how else am I supposed to have an honest conversation? Like, I'm not interested in talking about the weather. All of us have this finite amount of time on, on Earth, and we, you know, we want to do as much good as we possibly can while we're here. And we can only do it through the channels that are available for us, or we can start forging new, new channels, and, and that's a very difficult thing to do. So it's like within the Filipino community, I kind of feel like I do this dance, I've been doing this for decades, where it's like, I try to, Hi, Jets. <laughs> um, I, I try. I try to become involved in that community, but they are so resistant to any kind of change, which is a shame because um, I, I feel like I am representative of a lot of people who don't feel like they have a voice, who are interested in their heritage but they are really frustrated because they don't feel like they're heard, you know, any time that they have tried to speak. So in my art, what I started to realize, um, you know, for many, many years, I was just doing realism, but even through my realism, um, there was always this idea of, of trying to make spaces for those who get overlooked and aren't seen or heard. Um, which is like one of the reasons why I like to use um, gold in a lot of my pieces, like gold leaf, because I feel like it's a good way to, to question, like, what is it that we actually value? You know, like, what are the things that we, we say? I mean, you know, because like, as they say, it's like, you're, 
you put your money where your mouth is. Like if you really mean it, it's gonna be the money that speaks. And so, you know, it's it's always great to say, you know, like, oh, I support this and I support that, but but if you aren't actually physically doing something or putting your money there, then it is really just words. And those who are voiceless, they they are very aware of that often inauthenticity, which is another reason why I love working with children, like the high school students I work with. Um, I think people, I think a lot of adults don't give children enough credit. Children are not stupid, you know? I mean, like, here we are spending all this time teaching them values, and then they see all these adults around them um, dishonoring those values on a daily basis. And they understand fairness. You know, they understand the concepts of fairness and love and, and what you're supposed to value. And then as they grow up, they become more and more jaded. And I feel like it's our responsibility to, to help them hold on to that light inside them because that's who we really are. You know, we're beings of light and love. We're not beings of hate. You know, like those, those things come out of fear and, and it is hard to be brave in a world that is trying to shut you down. Um, so like in, in my work, um, there's always this underlying idea of identity because there's so many different layers of it. And um, the jumping off point was when I thought about what does it mean for me? What does it mean to be a Filipino American in the 21st century? What does it mean? Like, is there such a thing as Filipino American art? I have no idea. Um, that, that, I love that question because um, if anybody knows Ken Wright, the artist, um, he and I, I, I miss talking to him because he's such a great guy, but we had this great conversation because he's an abstract artist. And um, so part of his work is strictly abstract and then another part of his work has to do with the Buffalo Soldiers. Um, but he says like he never knows what to say when people try to call his work black artwork, you know, African American artwork. And you know, I feel that because it's like, no, we are, we're artists, you know? But you also can't get away from your identity. Um, I, I strongly believe that everybody's artwork is, is somehow autobiographical, you know? It's, it's very nerve wracking. If, if you are not an artist, or if you are an artist who doesn't actually put your work out there for people to see, it is, in a lot of ways, it's like, ripping pages out of your diary and like taping them to a wall. Like it is, it is very exposing. Um, and, and of course, like any writer will tell you, the moment you release something out into the world, people are gonna interpret it however they want. Um, and, and so you have to kind of learn to be okay with that. So the jumping off point for my, my work when I really started to question you know, who I am as a Filipino, how much of that of my heritage do I want to include in my life, I start thinking that the materials would be a good jumping off point to try to connect. Because I don't feel connected to the Philippines. The last, like I've been there three times. The first two times I went, um, totally did not feel connected at all. Uh, the first time I went, I was about eight, um, and I hated it because it was hot. The flight takes forever. The ice cream was purple and weird. Like, where's the chocolate ice cream? You know, I'm like this little kid, like we had to have powdered milk, which I had never had before, because it's so hot that if you are not wealthy, which most of my relatives are very, very poor, um, you know, you get powdered milk and it tastes really gross. Like, and it's tepid, you know, it's like really, really wrong. So like, as a kid, like this is all I could remember, you know? And then my husband and I went together in um, 2001. And, um, you know, at that point, my parents were like paying for the whole trip. They were pretty well off. You know, they wanted to do it all in style. So like we were staying at like the West Inn and there's, I mean, it was just like, it was very fancy. We were staying in all these really nice places. Um, my husband had a blast. He loved it. He'd already done a lot of traveling uh, when he was younger um, because he was in the Marines, um, but, I still hated it. I hated it because there's no personal space. Like the Philippines, um, when you stand in line, uh, the people behind you will literally be touching you because they're that close. 
and and I'm a very like this is my bubble, like I don't know you, and and we were at this um, department store because we needed jeans because I didn't pack any, and literally like it's it's a very interesting country because um, so many people do have their college degrees, but there aren't enough jobs. So at something, there's a store called Shoe Mart, which is like SM now. Um, it's basically like a department store. And when you go in, like, I don't like shopping, so I just want to be left alone. And like three saleswomen, young women, came over and were trying to pull out all these clothes for me. And I'm like, no, no, please go away. No, I'm fine, please go. And my husband, he's just like, oh, this is great. Yeah, I'll try that parrot. I'll try that parrot. You know? So like, he came out having bought a whole bunch of stuff. And I didn't buy anything because I was just like, I hate this. Um, you know, so my impressions of the Philippines had been um, less than stellar. And it's still really hot. And then this last time that we went in April, it was a lot different. I got to take my oldest kid. And my sister um, you know, came with us. So it was the three of us. And my parents uh, were now living in a place that's a lot cooler, where at night you could actually, you might need a jacket. It was so much cooler there. And, um, you know, getting to see it through the eyes of my oldest kid, who this was their first time being on a plane, you know, uh, traveling to a foreign country, and she just absolutely loved it, like loved it. And I was thrilled, and I was able to finally relax and enjoy myself. I actually got to do things that I wanted to do, like visiting a few art museums, you know. Um, but that has been something that's very difficult to do. A friend of mine who's also, um, who grew up here, uh, she has been working on organizing trips for first generation, second generation Filipinos like myself to be able to go on trips back home, as we say, which is always a funny thing to say since I was born here, um, but to experience the people and the landscape the way that we want to without that extra burden of having to spend time with the family. Uh, it's, it feels a little um, sacrilegious, I guess. Like, it just feels wrong. But I feel like it's absolutely necessary because um, it really is a wonderful place. I, I really enjoyed it. I actually do want to go back. You know, this is a very different thing because when I was eight, my dad said on the plane home, I said, like, goodbye, Ilo, Ilo forever, you know, because I was just like, I hated being there. And, and I mean, like, now I'm 47 and I finally, you know, am appreciating it because I get to do it through my own eyes and through my own experiences. Um, and so in the artwork, um, the materials that I started to play with are um, the barongs. These are um, formal wear uh, that um, Filipino men wear, and they actually are starting to make jackets for women too, which is really cool. So I have one. Um, so these, uh, the most expensive ones are hand embroidered, but these were like machine embroidered, and then there are different qualities of fabric. The fabric is actually made from um, the leaves of pineapples. Um, and uh, the funny thing is, I learned, first of all, pineapples are not native to the Philippines. They came over because of the Spanish. And second of all, the reason that Filipinos were encouraged to wear these shirts was so that they could not hide weapons uh, under their clothing because the Spanish didn't want them to rebel. Um, so it's kind of funny that now these are kind of a, a symbol of, you know, like this is, this is formal wear, you know? Um, so I have a couple of these and um, I, I have ordered just the fabric that doesn't have any embroidery on it, but I've also used these where I'm kind of cutting them up and putting them in pieces like this. So this is a piece that I cut off. And then these are capiz shells. They're also known as windowpane oysters because they are naturally translucent. Um, they're really neat looking. It's a, you know, so the, the piña cloth and the capiz are two major exports of, um, from the Philippines. And um, so those were kind of the materials that were my jumping off point. Um, and then I thought about like the capiz shells, the way that I'm used to seeing them. You might recognize these, um, especially living in a beach town. 
they are easily dyed into very bright, garish colors and made into like little wind chimes and things like that. Um, which, you know, for me as a kid, I've always thought that they're really tacky. So then I had this huge association with kitschy, cheap stuff being from the Philippines because, you know, you'd always see these made in the Philippines stickers on all these kinds of things. So it was just like another reason to adhere even more to American culture than to Filipino culture because it was like, is that all our people do? Is this tacky, tacky stuff, you know? And, and so for me, being able to play with these materials and see what they're capable of and try to elevate them from being um, these, you know, beachy souvenirs and, and things like that and see what I could do with them as an actual art material. And the more I got to work with them, the more I was really impressed, like with the capiz shells, I love how translucent they are, they're fragile, they're durable, they have this sheen. I mean, they really are stronger than you'd think, which I, again, you know, like whenever I look at materials and, and the things that interest me in bringing into my artwork, I always equate them with human qualities. So I am absolutely fascinated with how this pina cloth and the capiz shells, they're, they're both translucent, they look delicate, they're a lot stronger than you think they are, they can handle a lot, you could do a lot of different things with them. Um, they, I love that you can see through them, but what you see is a little obscured or distorted, which has become a really big theme in my work because I feel like this is how we see each other and this is how we see the world around us. Um, you know, when you see from a distance, if you try to look through a piece of this, you can't see anything. There's just like a little bit of light coming through. But like the moment you put it up against something, you know, you can start to actually see it exactly what it is, but it's still distorted, you know? Um, and I find that so interesting because I feel like, I feel that as a parent too. Like, no matter how well you think you know your kids, um, how well you think you understand them, you will never fully understand them. And I mean, like, it's, it's okay. That's just how life is. You know, we, each of us have parts of us that we want to share and parts that we don't. And, um, and so I find, like, that's one of the things I love about parenting and about teaching is, like, all you need to do is give them love and a safe space to explore the world around them and, and be there to catch them when they fall. And other than that, you just gotta kinda step out of the way, which is really hard to do. <laughs> it's really hard to do because it's like, you don't wanna ever want your children or people that you love to face heartbreak. But like, you know that they're gonna, because you have, you know? And that's just life, like that is just life. But then it's like, to prevent them from that, you are preventing them from being their whole selves. And, and becoming resilient, you know? Um, and it's like, as somebody who didn't babysit a lot, one of the things that amazed me the most when I became a mother was like, how this little baby that's only been in the world for like a few hours or a few weeks, like they come fully, fully built with personality to go. Like I, I and I, it's so embarrassing to say that, but I truly was like, oh, you're not just like a little lump that I'm gonna form, you know? Um, they, they have this full personality, you know? And, and as I've taught at the governor's school, one of the things that I realized that as a teacher and as a parent, um, my job, because of course, you know, not every kid's gonna like you that you teach, you know? And, and you're probably not gonna love every part of the kid either, but there's something amazing in each of them and so my mantra has become i just need to figure out what their superpower is <laughs> and help them use it to the best of their ability like that's all i need to do you know and um and kids really respond to that um i've been very fortunate that even the kids that i in my head i'm like oh my god i don't want you in my classroom right now because you're really annoying me um I always remind myself, like, just step back. What's going on with this kid? And um, and when you kind of figure out their energy, then you know it's like, oh, okay, now I got you. We're good. And it's so funny because every single kid who comes into my classroom, who clearly is not impressed with me, 
Um, I just, I'm, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm, I gotta be the adult in the room and I'm certainly not gonna take this personally. And I just meet them where they're at. And, you know, the next thing I know, a couple weeks later, a couple months later, they love me. And it's only because I let them be exactly who they are. Like, I'll let them be grumpy that day, you know? Cause it's like, we're all human, you be you, you're having a bad day, okay, fine. You need to take a nap, take a nap, fine. But bring your A game tomorrow, you know? And, and it's like, it's, it's really simple. Like if you just let people be themselves and remember that it has nothing to do with you, um, people will, will bring their A game, uh, which I really love because it's like, that's, that's what the gift of teaching is. It's like you just, you put the materials there in front of them. And there are gonna be days when it's like, they don't understand what you're talking about. Cause I get this with my kids too. Cause like, I really try to be that parent that's not gonna just say, cause I told you so. Cause I hated that when I was a kid. And um, so I, you know, I'll explain things. And I'll say, look, I know you may not understand you may not agree, you may not understand today like why I'm doing this and why I'm making this decision, but I'm telling you why. And this is the best that I've got, you know? And, and then just let it go. And, and it's like, if you at least give them an explanation, then they at least feel like you, you do respect their intelligence, you know? Because again, I mean, God, kids are so smart. They are smart and intuitive, and it's like we try to beat that out of them to conform and you know part of me is like god i really wish i could see what the world would look like if everybody was just allowed to show up exactly as they are you know and i mean i'm not saying i'm perfect because like oh i'm so judgy i'm so judgy like i tell people all the time i'm such a snob about art i am but i also know my opinion doesn't matter you know like there's room for it all so you know it's like my judginess is always just kind of a joke because people know I'm judgy. And it's like, who cares? Who cares what I think? You know, it's just like, this is how I feel. Like, I mean, I'm probably never gonna go to Walmart in my PJs, but like, I absolutely understand how people feel and why they would do that, you know? Like, I totally get it. But I just like, I probably couldn't do that, you know? And, um, and you know, so, um, sorry, I've been kind of rambling. Uh, but, you know, coming back to the artwork, all right, let me get to this really important point because apparently I only have a couple of minutes left. So the pieces that I brought today, I've really been into um, leaning into the idea of quilting because when I was growing up, the only quilts I ever saw were in the homes of my white friends. And um, so they're actually exotic and foreign to me. But they're such a huge part of American history, like, um, you know, there's, there's a long history of, of um, white Americans having these in their homes, passing them down generation to generation, um, sharing the stories, you know, using these scraps of fabrics that are very important. And, and even in the black community, there's a huge history of quilts as like a means of, of survival and resistance and, and you know, um, but like Filipinos don't have those. It's hot in the Philippines, we don't need quilts, you know? So like, I never saw quilts in anybody's houses, but I loved them, because I'm a big history nerd, and I just, I love sewing, I love the idea of quilts. And um, the capis just felt natural, because they only, you know, like, the shells, the whole shells might be about as big as my hand. And they come, you can get them raw, you can get them cut in different shapes. So I usually order them off like Etsy and Amazon. So if anybody knows of a wholesale person, I really need one. Um, but so this one was, was the first flexible one I made. Um, there's a piece on both sides and inside are um, cut up pieces of rice bags. Uh, and this one I titled uh, Sugar and Spice and Everything Rice. That's what Filipinas are made of, because I wanted to intentionally make it look very sunny and pretty, um, but it's also hard, it's not a functional quilt. Um, 
because I, I'm really rebelling against the idea that we're just supposed to be pretty and you know, happy and stuff. It's like, no, we're whole humans. We all have a full range of emotions and ambitions and everything like that. And then um, this one um, is called the Anitos quilt. Anitos means ancestors, because when I was able to go to the Philippines in April, um, I begged my parents to please take me to my grandparents' gravestones, and I was able to get gravestone rubbings. So for me, like, this one's not for sale. Uh, because I, I did some charcoal gravestone rubbings of all my grandparents' graves and cut it up because, you know, this is, it's a part of me. Whether or not today I understand how it's a part of me, someday I might. A lot of artwork that I do, I just kind of do it and then the meaning starts to come through later on. Um, this, this one has like illustrations from a book that I loved reading when I was a kid. It was one of the books that first got me interested in learning to be an artist myself because I loved the illustrations so much. But a lot of these quilts that have these illustrations from this particular book, they're from a fairy tale book because those are the stories that I grew up with. And it literally did not dawn on me until about a year ago that I did not grow up hearing any Filipino folk tales or fairy tales or anything. Like I just didn't grow up with that. I grew up with like Red Riding Hood you know, Cinderella, like those are the stories I grew up with. And, and these are the things that shape us, you know? So like, no wonder I'm so Americanized because I was encouraged to be Americanized. But then on the other hand, I was also encouraged to be certain parts of Filipino. But like, it's like these two kind of warring things because a lot of the expectations are at odds, you know? And it's like, well, how can I express that in my work and how can I, uh, bring that forward. So like now a lot of the work that I'm starting to move toward has to do with reaching back all the way to my tribal roots. Because before colonialism, uh, the Philippines had a much more balanced culture between its feminine and ma masculine energies and women were much more respected. You know, a lot of this has to do with patriarchy and Catholicism and um, colonialism, you know, um, those structures have destroyed balance and those structures today are destroying the environment, you know? So now like this one, um, there are like leaf skeletons in between because it's, this one is called Memories of Green because all the greens in this are fabricated. They're man-made, the beads, the tassels, the paint, like none of it's natural. It's a facsimile of nature. In a lot of the pictures you can see pictures of nature, but it's not, you know? Um, so that's kind of like what I'm, I'm, you know, where my work is going. And uh, so like the idea of, of being native, you know, I've even tried to talk with my white students, like what are your roots? And they're so disconnected, they don't even know. But you have roots, we all have them. We all have pre-colonial, pre, you know, um, patriarchal and uh, roots where we are more in touch with the earth and we desperately need to get back to that kind of balance because, you know, even when I make work, I feel super guilty because I'm like, God, what if a bird chokes on my bead? Like if I don't, if I accidentally put a bead somewhere, you know, and it ends up in the trash. Like I, I am very conscious of the materials I use. So it's like, as I'm moving forward, I'm like, oh God, when I order shells, Am I contributing to the carbon footprint? Because like they're getting shipped from somewhere. I can't just pick them up here, you know? And, and it's, it's hard because there's that balance of, you know, trying to be the person that I need to be and do what I can while I'm here. But there's also like, well, what am I doing that's damaging as I, as I work? So that's, yeah, my brain doesn't turn off. Anybody else have like 50 tabs open all the time? <laughs> My husband's like, how have you not exploded? So, thank you. Uh, <laughs> beautiful. Thank you. We will have about 15 minutes after um, for you to come up and do some Q&A. But I also want to let everyone know you are going to be an artist of, in the atrium at MOCA, yeah. right? Do you want to give it the date some time? You know the... uh, yeah, it is um, the last two and first two Saturdays in May and June, like all day. So, yes. yes. <laughs>
So you can come and explore all 50 tabs in her brain on those days, because you have a whole day with her. Um, Rowena also has some beautiful pieces of art on display at Town Pavilion 2, right over on um, 22nd Street. So stop by and take a look at those when you have a chance to. So thank you all so much for coming out today. We're gonna go ahead and open up the door, um, but please come up and say hello to, the, to our artists. So you are welcome to touch the artwork. That's why I brought it, because you can't do that anywhere else. So if you want to touch, just be careful, because oh, pieces like this, you can slice your finger wrong, which I have. So just oh, yes. oh, and one more announcement. Our speaker next month is going to be Jimmy Oliveira of Lifted Media. The theme is perspective. And we're going to be talking about drone photography and videography. So come join us next month. Thank you.